Five, Patrick. Then Kobe. Hey folks, it's Lindsey Huddleston with SPS back in the building. The SPS Ed Show, that is. Minus one individual, uh, Terry McCord Jr., my uh, able-bodied co-host, is out. He was celebrating a birthday the other day, so I don't know if he's still out hanging. But no, uh, he's had some scheduling conflicts, but we're going to get him back. But I got a great crew, as always. Got Coach Orlando Watkins always holding us down. We got John, the insider, and we got Patrick. Patrick got away from uh, landing the helicopter. He got a few moments, so he'll be able to add some of his great views as well. But uh, always great to have you guys here. Uh, always great to talk about sports and current events. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we hope not to let anybody down with that. So a few things we want to talk about. I want to shout out to the Streets of Talking Podcast Network. My guys, Don Houston, the car man, and Clarence uh, Sumo Babor representing. I want to shout out the great state of Mississippi. We know that we got a strong signal going on down there. Want to shout them out. Also want to shout out the SWAC. That's right. Shout out to the SWAC. We're going to start off giving some SWAC updates. But with that, let me just say to Orlando and John, how both you guys doing right now? Doing good. Doing, doing good. good. Oh, you good? Doing fantastic. Patrick, you good out here? I know you out there too. Yes, sir. Doing great. Oh, man. Oh, man. The squad is good. So let's talk about the SWAC for a second. Again, shout out to our listeners out in Mississippi uh, representing all over that great state as well. And also with the SWAC, they got a lot of things going on. Before I get into football, uh, they're finishing up uh, their golf championship uh, as well. You know, uh, they got some great things going with that. Uh, also, uh, they're looking at moving their championship game. It's going to be moved to May 1st. Actually, it's going to end up being, instead of Alabama, it's going to end up being in Mississippi as well. They're going to be moving that game based on COVID. And uh, speaking of COVID, uh, Coach Prime and Jackson State, they had to have an unceremonious ending to their season. Their last game was supposed to be scheduled between Prairie View and m and it got canceled because of COVID. So talking about that and talking about the SWAC, and we appreciate our listeners there. We want to better get the SPS Edge podcast down there. Uh, maybe for a homecoming next time. But, John, I'll start with you. You know, all this talk about Coach Prime, and I got number love, Coach Deion Sanders. I'm a big fan, no doubt. But, you know, my question is that even though it looks like his team is going to be finishing probably about middle of the pack, if you will, uh, in their division in the SWAC, you know, was this a good situation, him coming down there? He didn't run the table. He wasn't, you know, a, a force to be reckoned with. But considering the corporate ties, Pepsi coming on board, the notoriety he's brought. You know, what do you think, you know, uh, the take on being the first season of uh, Coach Dion uh, being there? And I'll ask your uh, thoughts as well, Orlando and Patrick. Well, uh, it, it was a great move for Dion Sanders because that's what he wanted to do. And, it was, and it's a great move for Jackson State. And it's a great move for the SWAC. And I'll tell you why. Number one, how could you expect a guy his first year to come in and he's got everybody, he's got the players that were left there. He got probably got a few transfers in, but he, like everybody else, has to have a little bit of time to build his personnel. But I want to tell you something, and, and, and you put this in your book. It was noted this week that since Deion Sanders has become the head coach at Jackson State, he has brought $185 million That's it. to Jackson State University. Wow. $185 million since he walked in the door. So, baby, boom. Take off your football uniform, Deion. You just hit a home run. Knock it out the park. And, and you look at the number of four-star commits he's got coming in the class of 2021, and he's making progress in the class of 2022. This is going to uplift Jackson State University. 
it's going to uplift the conference and it's going to uplift college football. No doubt. Showtime, baby. You no got doubt. the right guy in the right place at the right time. 185 million. I'll stand. Atlanta, I want to get your thoughts and Patrick, we're going to get you too. Thank you for joining us as well. Atlanta, what do you think about that? Well, I absolutely agree with John. It's uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it's all about the entertainment and that money. And he brings it all. He, he brings, he, he's bringing the entire package. It's the entertainment value. He's bringing in the money. Um, you know, jury's still out on whether, you know, he'll put together that competitive team, that incredible team. But the bottom line is they don't care about that right now. They're, they're getting dollars that they've never gotten before. Right. They're getting interest that they've never got before. And that's what it's all about. Right. And you're going to, you're going to see that effect going throughout HBCU at this point. Mm, this they, they're go, they, they, now you're going to see the swag really start to, to be that viewed conference right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they're going to push and push because, you know, right now I'm not, you know, I, I watch the swag during basketball, things of that nature. But right now, with him in that, I'm, I'm watching more swag football just because he's there. It's must see TV now, huh? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, Patrick, uh, you was giving us some information uh, prior to the show starting. What's your take on uh, Coach Prime and what's going on and what that may do to the rest of the SWAT? Well, I I, uh, I agree with Orlando. And uh, the last <clears throat> the last point you made is, is everything. Um, we weren't talking about Jackson State as much. We weren't. They weren't in the conversation. And now with, with uh, prime time being there, it's uh, it's the the conversation is growing about HBCUs, and Deion Sanders made a statement last week mm-hmm. that Ray Lewis and Ed Reed are very interested in getting their own team, and I think it it does nothing but make the SWAC better, and, and it brings more eyes and um, attention to the HBCUs, which is what they want. I get it. I get it. So let me pose this devil's advocate question to you guys. And also want to thank our sponsors, the Ratio Williams Foundation. I want to thank Gilead Sports as well as Dick Sporting Good for uh, helping us keep this out here. So my question to you guys, and I guess I'll start. Well, I can't say well, one coach. I got coaches everywhere right here. I'll start with you, John, in Orlando. And then, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, John, Orlando, then Patrick. This whole idea about Ed Reed and uh, Ray Lewis, the Hall of Famers, no doubt, coming in. But can you argue that there's a cutting the line type, you know, attitude that comes with this where you got other SWAC coaches who've been in the trenches, who've been, you know, down for the SWAC when the SWAC didn't have these, you know, Pepsi uh, uh, contracts, weren't making $185 million to Orlando's point and John's point. But, you know, you got guys who've been coaching for a long time. And now just because you got a Hall of Famer, I mean, Magic Johnson was a great ball player, had championships, but wasn't one of the best coaches. So do you think – uh, it's fair that these guys can just, you know, get teams, if you will. And this is me, again, being devil's advocate. I'll start with you on that, John. What do you think? Well, first of all, uh, I'll go back to a interview I saw with Samuel L. Jackson. And he's – Samuel L. about to get a team, too? You about to get well, a team? No, no, listen. Just, just listen to me for a second. <laughs> he's going to do a movie with 50 Cent. He tells the producers, he tells the directors, Hey, look it. That's fine. Don't you ever put him in a camera with me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do an acting scene with him. He he's a he's a rapper, and you're just taking advantage uh, 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 of his stardom right now. And I worked my ass off to get where I'm at. I had I had to go to acting school, and I had to do all these things and take these jobs. So you're not gonna put me on camera. And he did. So, I mean, there's going to be some jealousies. There's going to be some guys that are angry about this. But in the long run, baby, how many clicks did you get this week's episode? Huh? How many clicks did your football team get this week? Yeah. How much exposure did you get? It's all things have changed. And what Deion Sanders and what, like, Ed Reed or Ray Lewis got to do is they've got to, Bring in the best assistants they got that 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 are football lifers. Pay them a good salary and build these schools into good, solid football programs. 
Excellent, excellent. Uh, Orlando, what's your take? Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it, at the end of the day, it's all about the money. It, it is all about the money. And whatever brings in that money, you, you're going to see other HBCU programs just do whatever they can to emulate exactly what's going on there um, by hook or crook. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I hate that. You know, I don't want them to go go as far as making it, you know, damn near the WWF. Yeah. You know, the prime time wrestling. But I mean, it's going to get to that point. Yeah. I mean, because at, at the end of the day, sports is entertainment. Right. That's true. And, and that's what we're all looking for. True. Hey, Patrick, you know, let me pose this question to you. You know, we talk about empowering the black community and kind of going against my devil's advocate point. Here you have these pro athletes who've done well for themselves. They got name recognition. They got money. They got connections. And now they're directing these resources to HBCU. So I guess is this also kind of like, you know, some Elysium? This is kind of like heaven on earth now where finally you got these guys who have done well putting these black colleges on bringing that coaching expertise in. I mean, does it, is it really kind of a perfect scenario when you talk about bringing these guys back and the money they can bring and the attention they can bring to these underserved schools? I think so. I, I would agree with that statement fully. And, you know, another thing is um, whether they put in the work or not, when you look at the game of football, I think they've put in – you. you come down to Ray Lewis or Ed Reed, these are not your – average guys that we're talking about this isn't a pro that you maybe not heard of or anything like this these are guys that are recognized as hall of famers as as arguably the greatest at their position Woo, you know? yeah, and, yeah. and uh, you know i i'm i'm a firm believer that the 2000 ravens is the greatest defense uh in modern day uh yeah. unless you go back to you know the steelers still curtain but my curtain take it back my right. day, Ed Reed and Ray Lewis were the brains on the field of that defense. Sure. And uh, if you are a if you are a linebacker in high school, or if you are a safety or a corner, where would you want to go if those guys were coaching? I mean, they know exactly what to do to get to the next level. You they know. The key. They know. Also, they know. They've been in positions now outside of the NFL where they know, hey, maybe if you're not that good enough to go to the NFL, but you want to be a part of the game, you can do this. So I believe that they're the right guys for those for those jobs right now. Excellent points. Excellent. Again, this is Lindsey Huddleston with the SBS Edge Show. I got John, the insider. Patrick, the insider as well, or insider number two, if you will. <laughs> Coach Orlando Walkers, we're missing my guy, the young Jedi. Terry McCord, but we are still bringing it. So to your point, Patrick, we'll kind of keep it on that level. I like what you said about if you're a high school guy, you know, Penn State have been known for being linebacker university, but now wherever potentially Ed Reed or Ray Lewis is going to go, you want to go there. So bringing it back up north uh, to Michigan State uh, on this Saturday, Michigan State will be holding their spring game. Uh, they'll be having approximately 6,000 fans there. And uh, Coach Mel Tucker will be the first one to tell you uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a fancy type day. It's going to be very much a meat and potatoes type uh, practice. You know, I had a chance to talk with him and some other people the other day, uh, but also he said it's going to be a really important time for those uh, freshmen to kind of get in and get their looks uh, to see what they're going to do and how they're going to respond. So I think that's going to be a good thing. But to your point, you know, uh, Coach Tucker has been on the NFL level. He knows what it looks like. And if you look at that portal, so many of these players that are coming to Michigan State through the portal are coming based off Coach Tucker's uh, uh, NFL uh, pedigree. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to play uh, a few moments of us talking just uh, yesterday about that. Uh, can't make the tub in the club. Uh, can't make the club in the tub. That's worth repeating. I just want to say that. Uh, to Max follow-up, you know, uh, as it relates to the excitement, is there still a mental toughness? expectation even though it's not an actual game scenario you still want you guys to be locked in you still want everyone to do the things they're supposed to do even though there's like some glamour and glitch going on yeah i mean it's going to be a, a meat potatoes type practice you have to be a whole lot of pastry in terms of inside the lines whatever's going on outside 
the lines. It, it is what it is. But in terms of the practice, you know, we don't do what we do. We got to get out there. We got to get working. I mean, that's, that's practice 15 for us. And it's not another opportunity to get better. You know, aggregation of our friends. We just got to get one, two percent better. Everything we're doing every day, individually and collectively, that's the goal of our practice. And as a quick follow-up for the, you know, incoming freshmen, the early signees like the Ethan Boyd or someone like that, do you think this is going to be a real big experience for them because the lights will finally be on? Yeah, I, I think it will be. We'll see how they uh, how they react. I mean, that's part of that's part of the process. I mean, that's really part of the progression. You, know, you just take it from you know, the meeting room, and you take it to the walkthrough, and you take it to. Uh, you, know, you, you take it to individual, then you take it to group work, you, you take it to a scrimmage, and you, t- you take it to a live, take it to a, a, a live game. You know, this is the closest to you know a live game that you can really get when you get in, the, you get into the stadium and you have, you actually have fans and you, and you, you, you do go live. And so even though it's not going to be a total game format, it's going to be more of a glimpse into how we run our practices. It's going to be very competitive. Uh, we are going to have some live periods in there, uh, and there, there's going to be fans, and, they, and they, there's, going to be some, there's going to be some excitement, and there'll, there'll be some pressure as well. I got it. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, right there, I got my guy, Coach Mel Tucker. Great, great guy. I bet if he wasn't out getting ready for the spring game, he could sit with us and have uh, the same conversation on the same topics. Really a great guy. Uh, happy that our relationship has developed the way it has. John, let me start with you, and I'll get Orlando after that and uh, finish with Patrick. Uh, how important are these spring games? I mean, it's one thing to, you know, follow through on that Big Ten uh, network contract that they have because it will be aired on the Big Ten network. Uh, I'll be watching it uh, from home because I'll be post-surgery instead of being in Spartan Stadium. But how important are these games? You know, uh, is it really just, you know, kind of – making sure that you're taking care of the season ticket holders. Uh, do you think these uh, teams really get a lot out of that? Well, no, you, you, you can't, you can't put enough emphasis on, uh, on the 15 practices that they got. And, and it, it gives a chance to uh, teach these young guys some, some technique that you're trying to teach them. And you get to see, uh, whose motor is, is, is high octane. And it's very important. Anytime you can put a uniform on and go out and practice, you know, you're, you're going to find out some things about your team. Uh, so uh, spring and then the spring game, uh, it gives a chance to bring the thing I like about it is that, you know, you take that opportunity to bring back former players and, and that's real important in your program because these guys can do things for you recruiting that other coaches, that coaches on your staff can't do. You can't put enough emphasis on players that have been there, played there, and then are willing to give you the support. And, and he needs, uh, he needs all, all those ingredients to uplift this team from where it was before he came and where, where it is this second year, because basically really he's starting all over again with when he came in and the COVID you just, you know, it, it's miraculous. I mean, he beat Michigan, he beat Northwestern, but I mean, no spring practices, everything was, was different. So it's real important. Uh, the spring and the spring game. I get it. I get it. Yeah, you're right about that. Last year, you know, almost doesn't count, though he got the Michigan win, the Northwestern win. Orlando, what's your take on this spring game and the hype that's going on around it? I think this spring this spring game is is more important than probably any of those in the past because at this point, you know, COVID, you know, kind of changed the game. And right now, the spring game, you know, and I, I agree with John as far as bringing alumni back and everything else, but you've got those recruits that have yet to sign that are going to be in the stands and that's going to be the factor. Right. This game could be a huge factor that, that, you know, I don't have the exact number, but I'm going to guess is at least probably five recruits. I want to say six or seven. You're right on point though. You're right on point that that are going to be in those major recruits that are going to be in the building. And he needs those recruits. So this is, you know, this is just not your run of the mill spring game. 
I, I, yeah. I get, you know, running over reps, seeing what you got. But instead of just seeing what you got, you know, you have the potential of seeing what you're going to get. Yeah, and, yeah I, I like that. that. Yes, yeah. and, yeah. and I think that's important. And, and also, uh, Coach Tucker didn't talk about that in the press conference. I know he's constantly has an eye and ear on recruiting and what's going on. What do you think, Patrick? Uh, I agree with um, uh, John in Orlando, but um, there's one thing that everybody forgot. The fan base. Right. Give it up for the fans. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I give it to the fans. You got, you got guys like me that are diehard Spartan fans and – I want to see what freshmen came in the door. Are they going to do anything? Or or also this brand new transfer portal that's so great for everything. So you get to see guys that you didn't see last year. So maybe we we fill in some spots here. Hey, we really needed that guy. I saw something that, that's going to help us uh, for the regular season. Yeah, you're right. And when you talk about guys we didn't get to see much, uh, I'm going to take a quick break and I want to share uh, uh, my – Quick question that I had with Elijah Collins uh, out of Detroit, uh, U of D High School. Um, Elijah uh, Clyde Collins. Let's uh, share uh, my questions with him right here, real quick. Question about Lindsey Huddleston. Hey Elijah, uh, I kind of want to follow up on that question. You talking about pressure making diamonds? You know, with all this talk about the crowded uh, running backs room, you know, uh, how do you take the attitude into that part? These are your teammates. These are people you're competing with too. So how do you make sure that you can um, kind of rise to the occasion uh, with the competition in that running back room? Competition, honestly, it brings out the best in uh, everyone. So, I mean, for us to have a crowded running back room, per se, it makes it makes it makes it pretty fun, honestly. Because, I mean, you know you're going to get the best from everybody. Everybody's going to give it their all just to be that back, be the back that Coach you know, Tuck wants. So, I mean, it makes it, it, makes it kind of fun, honestly. And to be able to do that with people that are good people, I mean, it makes it actually really fun. That's great. I got a quick follow-up to that. Were you always like that, or was this part of the progression you had going from high school to college, or did you pick up that somewhere along the way, that mentality you have now? Uh, the mentality, it, it started off in high school because I, I knew that I wasn't the only good player out there. I mean, I kind of, like, look at the rankings a lot, but it ultimately didn't mean anything to me that much. Like, the rankings were just rankings that were there. But at the end of the day, it was about how much work you were willing to put in, like, while they were sleeping. So, for me, that's that's kind of, like, how I started. And then once I got to college, it kind of became, like, a more of a, like, more of a concrete way to think about things because, I mean, like, everybody wants to be that guy, be that back. So, I mean, they're doing everything they can to do that. And so I'm going to have to do everything I can to be that. Great. And I appreciate your middle name, Clyde, too. I think that's real smooth, man. I like that. Thank you. It's, it came from my great-grandfather. Respect. I appreciate you. Thanks. You got to love a kid named Clyde, man. Come on, man. <laughs> Clyde, you know, I love it. Uh, I think that was appropriate to have him because to your point, Patrick, you know, those guys you haven't seen and what we didn't talk about in the brief uh, interview that I had with uh, Eliza was that he had COVID last year. And when he shared that, I think um, the press kind of jumped on it because they had not been releasing what players had COVID for a number of reasons, you know, HIPAA reasons or just privacy. But when he shared that and talked about his weight gain, his weight change, it, it was really touching. But also going back to Coach Mel Tucker, and this is a broader conversation we're having about the SWAC and the Coach Prime Times and the Ed Reeds potentially and the Ray Lewis is coming in. He talked about having sit downs with Coach Tucker and how that helped him have a laser focus, a laser focus. So here's a kid overcoming COVID crowded running backs room, but he's locked into the new head coach. He's having a laser focus and he's talking about mental toughness. So I thought it was interesting to bring him up. So what I want to do, I want to transition, uh, not from Michigan state, but to another sport, but talk about somebody showing some mental toughness, probably more than uh, we've shown in our collective years is Josh Langford. First of all, I want to say Josh is my guy. He's been my guy since he got here to Michigan state. Uh, hey man, you got a day job or something, Orlando? How you get all these images just to pop up? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, man. <laughs> Dang, man. We appreciate you over here at the SBS Edge, man. But right there, right on time, I got Josh Langford. So I'll start with you, uh, John, just getting your idea. You know, he said he's not going to pursue a pro career. I think many of us saw that probably when the injuries kicked in and we weren't able to see him go hard as a junior, you know, we kind of thought that as well. 
Uh, but what's your take on his idea of not pursuing a pro career? And uh, just give me your take overall on Joshua Langford. Well, I, I have a lot of respect for him. I mean, listening to the different interviews with him over the years and, and, and seeing how he conducted himself at Michigan State. And, and just, I mean, I'm sure he came there thinking that he was an NBA basketball player and life takes turns sometimes that we have no control over. And things happen. He had injuries. He didn't have the career uh, that, that he probably thought he was going to have when he was 17 years old. But to be mature enough to, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, because you probably know this more than I do. I understand he had a double major. Yeah, well, he has he has his uh, degree in his undergrad in advertising, and in June he'll have his master's degree in sports coaching leadership. Well, see, I mean, how can you not respect anybody that does the has done the things he's done? He's taken this and all through the biggest disappointment. I came here to be a basketball player. I came here to be part of a team, a recruiting class that wins a national championship and to have these injuries pile up on him, yet he stays the course and takes care of himself off the basketball floor. And he said something the other day, I, you know, I don't want to be defined as a basketball player. You know, I, I, I want to be defined as a good human being that works hard and, 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 and has faith. So, I mean, I, I, I just applauded when I read about this. I, I, I just I, I felt so good for him. And listen, there is nothing, nothing but great things ahead of Joshua Langford. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, Patrick, before I want to come back to you, I want to go to Orlando. Orlando, like all of us on this uh, podcast, we've been around the ballers. You know, you've been around them, too. You know, you got ballers in your family picking up 10-day contracts. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you know how this game goes where some guys are like, okay, he could have been this or he should have been this. But I think, and you tell me what you think, I think Joshua Langford will fall in that category that he's going to get respect across the board from guys in the league, coaches, to say, dude, you could have been here, and we're going to respect you. Not we're going to just show you love to make you feel good, but, like, dude, your game was solid as a freshman and sophomore. You were out for two years. So I just think that he's going to kind of have that kind of flow where if it's not working with an NBA team, he's going to be able to kind of carry himself in those circles with the respect of somebody almost like a Grand Hill, like, like, you know, you, you, your career was cut short. You know, what do you think about that comment? No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. The respect level that, that he's going to gain from making that type of decision is, is phenomenal. He, he, he's, he's very based in reality. He understands, and it's clear that he understands. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a cutthroat, ruthless type of game. And if you're not at, at your A game at 100% of the time, and if you feel that you can't compete, you need to kind of move to the side. You know, there's a lot of guys out here still dreaming, uh, you know, playing in the ABA, you know, the semi-pro leagues, or going over to Europe and doing this. This is a guy that realizes, look, I got an education from Michigan State. It's time for me to move on. I'm going to make the most of what I can, can get, you know, can get out of this degree. And he's going to get a lot out of it coming out of Michigan State because there's a ton of alumni that's going to come right at his feet. And let's like say, look here, the door's open for you. Now, see, it's and funny you say that, that because, you know, those are things that I truly believe are the case for Josh. Patrick, let me ask you a question uh, from a youthful perspective, man. We can say how mature he is, like John said. I get it. You know, and, and, and I said it. We all say it. But, dude, let's talk about that maturity you got to have to say. I mean, and it speaks to his religious roots because there got to be more going on than him just being mature. That he can say, you know what, I'm not going to try, to Orlando's point, to try to go overseas or try to, like, what does it say about his level of maturity to be able to say, I'm not even going to try uh, compared to somebody who's going to still try to push, who's going to still try to just, I got to see, and just kind of 
create this kind of energy that, you know, I don't want to give up yet. Well, I think it goes to the statement of him saying that he doesn't want to be judged as a basketball player. He wants to be judged as a human being. It shows it shows more than maturity. It shows confidence. You know, there's so many basketball players or just let's just say athletes, period, that think that that's what they're here for. They're, I will. I, if I can't play basketball, well, well, I can't do anything. And it's obvious he feels completely opposite than that. And it shows a confidence in a young man that he can go take his chunk out of life however he wants to carve it. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it, cause in my opinion, I, I, I think he could play in the Euro league right now. I think he could play in the second highest paid league in China, you know, but he thinks that his degrees and what he's, he obviously has more opportunity here. So it, it doesn't just show maturity to me. It shows, it shows a lot of confidence and it's, I respect, I respect the heck out of it. Yeah. I can appreciate that. Well, speaking of someone who's also kind of having a reality check, uh, newsflash just yesterday, Foster lawyer has gone into the transfer portal. Now, Here's the thing about Foster, man, and, and, and I'm, I, I don't know any other way to say it, but I think that this is probably the one guy, John, that there was a collective hooray or cheer when he did that. And I'm not making him out to be a villain, but I'm just saying that people just felt for so long that, you know, that was, a, in my view, a political scholarship. I know I may be stretching it, but Clarkson is Clarkson, strong, quote unquote, conservative base. Uh, you have a team of predominantly white, excuse me, black kids. You got this one guy who was, in fact, you know, Mr. Basketball. And, and, and he could get out there and mix them up. High basketball IQ, no doubt. Uh, come from a, a sports family, his dad, uh, NBA coach and all that. But now it's at the point where, like, okay, dude, instead of me just holding on, this is the case. So I guess to get your take on that is one thing, John. And Orlando and Patrick also, if you guys could chime in and say, where is he going to land at? Where will he end up being a good fit where with a healthy shoulder he can kind of get some shots up and give a team an opportunity? But my first question to you, John, is the controversial one about, you know, his scholarship to begin with. Well, uh, you, had, you had three connections on last year's team to Clarkston, and all three of them are gone. Wow, wow. We're talking coach as well, right? All right. So – he said, hey, 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 the Clarkson you know, ship is sailed. Something, something <laughs> here is attached, okay? Mm. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, like I've said before, I didn't think – I thought he was one of the best high school shooters I've seen. He was deadly, but that game didn't translate. And he went from, I believe, 45% shooting a three to 32 percent uh and he has to be careful where he wants to go because the match has guards and he'll have the same problems in the match <laughs> <laughs> hold on i don't mean to interrupt me, but you're just being so real like dude like you can't just go anywhere you go have them same no. issues no matter where you go there, there, there's no doubt about it and and you know what lindsay uh I don't know where the best place for him to go. I mean, you know, you have uh, uh, Orlando. What's the coach at uh, Edison? Uh, the coach Bo, for the family, Bo Neely. His Bo, son, yeah. Brandon, played at Oakland, and he couldn't play at Oakland. He was too small. He was too frail. He ended up going to Wayne State, and they won the league this year. Okay? So, you know – these other leagues got guards. The, the, the mid-majors got guards. They just don't have the bigger people. They got guards. That's right. That's right. right. Six, I mean, seven is watch, considered big. You're yeah. watching this tournament this year. That, that There was guards that could go. And so. And then he's not a big guard on top no, of that. No, he's not. No. And, and you, know, I, you know, this is what I thought. I thought he would make a very good Division II player. Okay. A very good Division II player. But I think in my mind and from what I've heard and what I've seen about this young man is like last year when he was hurt. He's always there when the timeouts come. He's always helping his teammates. 
He was always talking to Dame Fife during the game. He was he, he, he he's in he's a basketball guy. And I think that he's a guy that's probably looking at a future in basketball, whether it be in scouting, whether it be in coaching or whatever. He's got the connections. But myself, if I was him, I'd go someplace that's going to enhance my education, and I would go Division Two. Wow! I don't think wow. he's. A, I don't think he's a Division One player. Do you think he has his? Is his ego? Uh, uh, would his ego be too big to get through a Division Two door? Would his head be too big to get through a Division Two door? Well, I, you know that I, from what I understand, he's always supposed to have been a pretty good kid. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, that, that's a good question. But, you know, I mean, hey, look, it, he has watched, he has been called in to film sessions. You know, you're going to get your Achilles operated on tomorrow. He wouldn't be able to guard you on Friday. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. Uh, so, I, I, mean, I get that. I, I mean, he sees this. He, he's, I seen get that. he's seen himself. You know, the film, film don't lie. lie. The film, film don't, don't lie. lie. Right. No. So I mean, and, and and this is where his father and his family need to come in and make a great decision for him. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if he doesn't end up at Oakland. Yeah, yeah. Before I, I go have... to you, Orlando, uh, and also Pat, I want to again thank our sponsor, uh Horatio Williams Foundation, Gilead Sciences, as well as the uh, Dick Sporting Good, and shout out to the Streets of Talking Podcast Network, Don Houston and Clarence Babor. Orlando, what do you think about Foster? Where is Foster going to land? Um, you know, I, I, got, I have to agree with John. It, it has to be a D2 or a low mid-major. I mean, it, the issue is, is that he's proficient in scoring when you run the offense for him. If you're running them off the screen, then great. But you're not, you know, at, at, at State, you, you're not going to tailor an offense for him. He's not. He's not the main option. You know, coming in, coming into college, you know, his high school. They're running that. You know, they're running those screens, the picks to get him for that set shot. Then he, he's he's pulling off those statistics. But when you get to college, I don't see any mid majors really, unless a small mid major, maybe a D two, would start tailoring the offense to him. And if you can get him off that screen and he can set his feet, then he's good. And he and he's useful, but outside of that, and and creating on his own, I don't think he can particularly do that. I mean, he's a good kid. I think he's a good leader. Like John says, he's a good basketball guy. But as far as being that asset on the court that you're looking for, without having to tailor your rearrange your entire offense for him. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Patrick, I got one for you along the same lines. I'll put this question to you. Uh, the gentleman talk about potentially D2. Can you see a D1, particularly uh, a Power 5 or a conference that says, let's bring you in so we can get some Michigan State insight, even if it's very likely you won't come in and contribute and play, you'll be part of this program, or to John's point, you'll have a great uh, access to our graduate school uh, whether it's going to some place where, hey, you know, it may even be a Stanford or a Harvard or other school that you may not necessarily play a lot, but you'll be plugged in. What do you think about that idea to keep the D1 flavor? Because who wants to go from D1 to D2 with these right. egos? Right. Well, you said Ivy League. Well, yeah. <laughs> the other day, me and my dad were talking about it, and I said Ivy League. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but at the same, at the same thing, you know, I mean, if it was, if it was. Uh, if I wanted to him to succeed, I, I would have liked to see him stay at Michigan State, but become a student manager or something if, if he's going to pursue a career in basketball. But if he wants to keep playing, uh, you know, they say D2 low mid major. I, I don't even see him getting on the floor there personally because there's not – it's not size that's his that's – his, that's his biggest – Achilles tenant, it's it's his non-athleticism. 
he's he's slow to he to be that small. He's because it'd be different if he was small and he could jump out the gym. Yeah, yeah. you know, there's so many. There's so there's five eight guards. There's there's five eight guards in the match. They are a headache, and they are a headache too. Quick as exactly. a exactly. You know, they hound you on the ball, and they they're there for the every. They contest every dribble. You know, he's not that guy. He's not. He can't. He's not going to beat anybody athletically, and he 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 gets taken advantage of. So I really, you know, I know guys in the MAC that are playing that they'd love to to, to line up against him. He was at Michigan State. He got a shot, and I didn't. Let me show this boy what it's really sure. like. You know, I don't want him to go through that anymore because mm -hmm. he he obviously is a smart guy, and like my dad said, he he was a prolific scorer in high school, but sometimes. That's what it is, you know, and and it's a different level. But you got guys like Christian Leitner, who weren't what they were one of the greatest college basketball, if not had the greatest college career ever. Absolutely. And the most points in NCAA tournament history, but it didn't translate to but one All Star game in an eleven year career and in the NBA. And, and then so that and that dream team that was just. That, that was gimme. That that was, that was like no. That was, that was like, aggressive. yeah. That was that 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 was just playing politics. I agree. Yeah. So you know, I kind of like I kind of like him to to pull a Josh Relinquard and move on, baby. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Well, on that, we're gonna transition. We got a few more talks with the time we have, and uh, although we miss our guy Terry, you guys are doing excellent. I appreciate you, Patrick. Uh, stepping in and sharing as well. Uh, great basketball and sports knowledge. But let's talk about somebody who was undersized but is doing the most in a good way. And I'll start off by saying I don't need nobody coming after me for what I'm about to say about Steph Curry. I <laughs> like Steph Curry. I don't have no beef with Steph Curry. But I got a problem with everybody saying, you know, and disagree with me if you please, but should he be in the MVP race? Because the one thing you need to know, <laughs> exactly, you own it, man. Uh, I gotta talk to uh, I gotta talk to Michelle. You must not be going to work, Orlando, because you just uh, in the studio putting all these clips together, man. So here's the thing: everybody's talking about him being an MVP candidate, or he should get up there. But his team has been losing. I know there are other criteria that go with it, but I'm saying from a mental standpoint, as an athlete, when you don't have anything to lose, when you know your team is not going to be in contention for a playoff run, a series playoff run, or anything like that. And you decide I'm just gonna shoot the lights out. Yeah, you can have these kind of performances. He's an excellent scorer, and everybody's going on and on and on. But if he do that when your team is in first place, you know what I'm saying? Do that when your team is in contention. Your team is not in contention. They're like in like ninth place in the league or something like that. So yeah. for me, I'm not hating on Steph Curry. I don't have a history of hating on him. But my question is. Why should he be getting all these type of type of accolades in that regard when his team is not in contention? Somebody tell me the part about my comment that's wrong so I can hear that side of it. I'll start with John, Orlando, Patrick. You know, the, you know the routine. Well, let, I, I'm just going to say one. I'm going to ask you one question, okay? You're you're uh, the coach of the Lakers, and you're playing uh, Seth Curry or Steph Curry. Tonight, you're telling your team what? He all right? He who who can hurt us here? That's a good point. Him good only. Point. Okay. Come on. So now I want all five of you. You know we we were not gonna let him get off, and and, and I'll I'll let Patrick take it from there. Go ahead, Patrick. That's all I got. Very um, good. There, you said nothing wrong. You said nothing wrong, but. And, I, and I'm asking for disagreement. I'm not, I'm asking for disagreement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I personally think Nikola, uh, the Joker is going to get it. Nicole Jokic. I think he's is he going to run away with it, or is Joel Embiid yeah, right there? Yeah. You you, you, you kind of you see him the other day. He had he had forty and forty and what eighteen and in the last two minutes with Jamal Murray being out too. With Jamal Murray being out in the last in the last uh, two to four minutes, which is what every NBA player says it's gold time and, and only the big boys step out in the last couple of minutes. And I think he's going to run away with it because he's the only superstar that that's not been, he hasn't spent any time out with injury. He you know, hasn't missed got, a game. You got every other superstar. I mean, what are there five hamstrings out right now? 
James Harden, <laughs> exactly. uh, Dame, Dame, Dame Dollar. He's this hamstring he's time. You know, this hamstring there, time. There, and so I personally think that Steph Curry is in the conversation because he's hot right now. You know, but you know there is always room to argue for Steph Curry to get MVP. He is absolutely the modern day Michael Jordan when it comes to transcending of basketball. He changed the game. Right. You got every kid out here now shooting uh, 30 footers. Okay. And for another thing, you know, if you want to give it to him, you know, stats wise, he is shattering the old man average. He's uh, only, only Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant over 32 years old have ever averaged 30 points. He's shattering that. Okay. 11, 11 straight games, 30 points or yes. more. Yes. That, that, that's a stat you can argue and and another record he's shattering. Do you know how many? Do you know the number two? We're not gonna go number one because he's number one. Do you know how many ten point threes that guys have had in the NBA? No. Ten point three games. Clay Thompson is at two on the list with five. Wow. Steph Curry is at six in the last month. Okay, he has two. He has two, he's over twenty five games now in his history in his in his career. Where he has more than 10 threes a game. And and then let's let's go to the best part of Steph Curry, the greatest part of Steph Curry. Great scores where they talk about Kyrie Irving and Dame Dollar and James Harden. Okay. When they score 30, they shoot 40 shots, man. They sh they shoot so many shots. Steph Curry is so efficient. He's he efficient. flirts with 50, 40, 90 every year of his career. It's unbelievable to me. Wow, the numbers don't lie. Numbers so, so, don't lie, John. You funny. John was real cool. John said, "I'm gonna show you the tape." He said, "I'm gonna put the video on and let you just watch <laughs> the film." <laughs> and that was it. Orlando, you chimed in a little bit, and I'm hearing you guys. And I did ask. I said, "Help me understand," and you guys are helping me understand some undeniable things about his stats and what he's doing. Orlando, what are you gonna share? Right. I'm just gonna leave 11 games over 30 points. I'm, I'm just leaving it right there. Yeah, I mean that that has to put him in the conversation. Yeah. Well, my question is, what is the my final question on that is, what is the true definition of MVP? The most valuable person on your team to do what? Uh, what you did on your team, or to push them towards a certain level of victory? I don't know. Is there a, a hard line definition for what the MVP is supposed to be? Because I always go back and forth with that. No, I think it's a gray area personally that yeah, you're saying right. I think it's a real gray area because <laughs> if you win by absolute most valuable player, then LeBron James will win every year. You know, he you know, he 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 leaves a team and they don't even make the playoffs. They go from the finals to a not playoff team. And you know, it's it's so rough because you know you have years like where they give it to Russell because he averaged a triple double, but sure. I think they were a six seed that year. True. Um, and uh, you know, and then this is a, this is another. It's this COVID is such a weird year. They're playing yeah. so con. You you see that these boys can't even stay healthy because it's so condensed, and they're packing so many games in. Right. Where your guys that are at the top of the list for that conversation are not playing so i think i really personally think it's a gray area and you know it's different every year you know they they give it to these past two years you've given it to number one seed and averaging 30 mm -hmm. which is Giannis. right but i i i don't think that he's the best player in the nba i don't think i don't no, think that, anybody would say that that's a strong that's a that's a whole nother show Right. Yeah. Whether he even deserved that. Right. 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 So it's a gray area for me. But then you also wonder if that was the league saying, we want you to stay in Milwaukee too. You know what I'm saying? Let's just, you know, create this type of environment that, that's conducive to you staying there and balance it. Guys, time is going well. We got a few more minutes left. And there two more things I want to touch on before we get out of here. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets. I just noticed, man, it's just so ironic. That uh, the picture that you're showing us right now, Orlando, that we appreciate. What was this like the first six games of the season? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you can't see these guys together. You almost wonder if they won in the same because you can never see them together on the court right now. Now, wow. people are saying, Oh man, these guys are great players, but excuse me if I got it right. You know, Kyrie has what one ring, KD has a few, no doubt. 
James has none. I don't know why people think all of a sudden when these miraculous hamstring injuries go away and James Harden can be playoff James again, that this is going to be this easy chemistry to come together with Steve Nash, who I don't have an issue with personally. Obviously, it's going to be this wizard of a coach and just get these boys ready to win the NBA championship just because they loaded. You know what they kind of remind me of? That Lakers squad that had who on there? Carl Malone, my guy GP, all these other great guys, but they lack the chemistry. And I think there's nothing different from that team and what this team is. Everybody's saying, oh, they go win the East, they go win it all. I don't even know if they got the East locked up. Because I tell you what, Joel B still got that bad feeling from a couple years ago when they lost to Toronto. And now he got a coach that he obviously believes in. They're making things happen. Ben Simmons' uh, confidence is there. I don't think it's a wrap for them. So you guys tell me, one, will these hamstrings miraculously get healed within the next 14 or so games when they get ready to start this playoff run? And secondly, what's going to happen with Brooklyn? Are Brooklyn is Brooklyn coming out the East, and is Brooklyn going to be uh, a contender for the NBA championship? Um. Uh I got I got two points for there. Uh, ben Simmons said about a week ago, you still have to play defense. And another point is, James Harden has played more minutes with the Rockets than he has with Wow and Wow Kyrie Irving. That's a fact. Wow, he's played more minutes with the Rockets this year than he has with those guys. So, and then he's out for another fourteen games. There's only a month in the season left. They only have four weeks before the playoffs start. And James got a history, let's face it, for bombing in the playoffs. Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. And let's not act like uh, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant are locked down defenders. And right now, it's, it, you know, and, and, I, and the only reason I'll take hesitancy on going hard on Kyrie is that from my inside source, John ain't the only one with an inside source. I got one or two around <laughs> here somewhere. Kyrie may be battling mental health issues. Absolutely. So with that being said, I don't think that's not even a knock on him. I think you can look at the totality of what happens. He's up one day, down another, and this is not a knock. So you talk about the lack of being locked in right there. And then Kevin, uh, I won't call Kevin Durant, and I say this respectfully, not being durable, but all you got to do is start tweeting at him. And in a minute, you know, he go potentially be distracted. Now, he uh, they say he didn't, he didn't tweet it more than he didn't score points. You know what I'm saying? Now, <laughs> he may turn around and drop 30 on you, but it just doesn't look like a team, unlike the Los Angeles Lakers, when they're going to magically appear to be healthy, that can come in, that has a history. Because as soon as some adversity comes, what's going to happen? They'll get to fighting and bickering and tripping. So I worry about that. Orlando, I want to get your perspective, and I'll finish with John before we get to our last topic, which is the guilty verdict that came down for uh, uh, Derek Chauvin. Okay, I'm going to get down to it. I'm going to hit the other side of it. I mean, irregardless of, of chemistry, we know chemistry – is the key element, but you still have to understand those three players. Mm -hmm. They could just take turns and demolish teams. Let me get my 10. Now it's your turn. Let me get my 10. Let me get my 10 and just rotate and demolish teams. True. So I don't, I don't, you know, I, I hear the chemistry argument being set out there over and over and over again. And I, I'm going to be quite honest. I don't think they're even thinking towards chemistry. Mm. I'm thinking they, they just feel that they can just dominate teams. I think they're going to throw in a, a basic isolation play and run all three of them through it and just dominate teams. I, I think that's their philosophy. I think that's what they're going to because there's absolutely no way with them sitting out like that that you're going to – that you can – develop any sort of team chemistry with them right. you, you you gotta go with for you gotta go for what you know i know that they can beat anybody one-on-one -on -one right that you put against them and that playoff is a whole different animal them offs is a whole different animal no doubt john what's your take well I, i'm gonna say this there, there's nothing more that the media and people like to do to building up something if these guys don't win, they are going to be on their ass <laughs> like you have never seen before. Yeah. They have got – they are going to have to deal with it because they didn't bring all those guys together 
to give a crap about how you feel today, whether you're injured today, whether you didn't play the last 14 games. They brought these guys together to win a ring. Yeah. And if they don't, anything else less than that is failure. And Skip and his little uh, uh, buddy and the rest of them are going to be Killing roasting their asses. Uh, quick follow up on that. What happens to Steve Nash then? I think Steve Nash will be fine for a couple of years, even sure. if they win or lose. But to Orlando's point, you know, that's what got that's what got the Heat beat in the finals. You go, I go. You go, I go. I don't think it works in the NBA playoffs. I don't think the NBA playoffs is a I'm gonna score you game. I don't think it is. And you have to play defense in the playoffs. You have to be on both sides of the ball in the playoffs. It's the only reason Toronto had that chance to beat the 76ers. They played defense. They mm-hmm. they 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 built the wall to beat Giannis, and now it's the blueprint. You know, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, Brooklyn it Brooklyn, Brooklyn ain't worried about defense right Brooklyn, now. Brooklyn, to your to your poor Orlando, Brooklyn, you're right. They have the three best one-on-one basketball players in the world. Right. In the entire world, but that that I'm I'll shoot you. That doesn't happen in the that doesn't happen in the playoffs. It got I mean look look what happened to when uh LeBron came back from three one with, with against Golden State. You they can't out, you can't just say hey we're gonna score one thirty man. You guys are probably gonna crack the let him beat up Steph Curry. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. you know, if, right. if you if 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 you push Kevin Durant out of his spots, is he? Is he in the basketball mind where he can go take over and have 30 if, if he's not comfortable? We have not seen that yet. Right. James Harden, he's been in game – he was in game seven against the Warriors, and they went 0 for 21 from the three-point line. Yeah, so, you know, and then also, are you hot enough to do it? I don't know. All right. Well, with that, we got one last thing we want to say. And then uh, let, time, let, let, me sorry, sneak, let me sneak this in real quick. Yeah. One minute. If I don't do this, they're going to kick me out of the family. But I'm, I got to give my shout out to Tyler Cook, our newest Piston. My, yes, my right. Cousin. He, he signed a multi year contract with the Pistons, so he's home. He's, he was with Brooklyn. Got his first start against Cleveland. And I'm telling you right now, he's dunking his way into the hearts of Detroiters all over the place. That's so great. Beautiful. That's, it. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. I think. On that note, I'd rather leave on that note. I thought I was going to pull from the headlines, and uh, we all saw a guilty verdict in Minneapolis. I know all these guys on this call don't disagree with that verdict at all, but we're going to leave with Tyler Cook. Let's put the family back up uh, for this last visual. That's what we're going to celebrate today uh, with that. Um, now, the one person I'm concerned about on this podcast is Patrick, because as soon as Terry listens to this, he going to come looking for you, Patrick. So I want you to make sure uh, – <laughs> You uh got some support around you all the time. Terry, a nice guy, but I don't know if he going to like how you was blowing it up on the podcast so smooth and good, <laughs> man. So, John, you keep an eye on him, okay? And if Terry oh. talk about he want to come go out for a drink or something, don't do it, you know? <laughs> but I say that jokingly. We love Terry for being out here. I want to thank you guys for bringing together another amazing show, uh, Orlando Watkins, John the Insider, and Patrick the Insider as well. This is Lindsey Hudson with SBS signing off. We'll see you guys next time. Shout out to the Streets of Talking Podcast Network as well. Mississippi, we'll see you soon. Swack love. Right, Mississippi. <laughs>